Okay, that's what we want to know about what manner of persons ought we to be. That's from 2 Peter 3.11. Now, how do our circumstances affect good Christian conduct? I think we can go now to the next slide. It's easier for us to follow the Lord when we know where he's going. Let's look at the major world events during 6,000 years of human history and Christ's millennium. Now, actually, we'll not go before the flood. You'll see this at the extreme left end here. Things that are above the line are good things. Things that are below the line are not good things, calamities, catastrophes, whatever you want to call them. The two greatest events, of course, have been the creation of man, that's Adam and Eve, and second, Christ's sacrifice to redeem them and all their progeny. Now, there have been many calamities during this period of time until now, but only a few have been worldwide. Since the flood, we have the Justinian plague of 541 to 590. That is something that you'll see a little after the time of Christ. Uh, it's about the middle of the chart here, and it's on the downside. It originated in Central Africa and then spread, spread through the Mediterranean. And it may have killed as much as half the population of the Roman Empire. It was serious in Europe, but it wasn't really worldwide. Now, the Black Death, or the Black Plague, of about uh, 1348, mid-14th century, originated in Asia. And it was more devastating in Europe, but it, true, was not really worldwide. It was not until the invention of steamboats and railroads that calamities could truly become worldwide, and of course, air travel the more so. Beginning about 1873, we have seen five major worldwide events, maybe six now with what we're going into, major worldwide events. There was the Long Depression, 1873 to the 1890s, World War I, 1914 to 18, the Great Depression, 1929 to 1939, World War II, 1939 to 1945, and then the so-called Cold War, East versus West, 1945 to 1989, when the uh, USSR uh, became dissociated. And now, in our own time, uh, the COVID SARS-2 pandemic. So today we want to talk about what we should do as Christians. Now, if we look at this chart, this isn't uh, from specific scriptures. This is history, just history. But we can see about uh, 4,000 years and a little more from the flood until relatively recently, there have been no really major worldwide events. But notice how they are clustered now in our time in the past 150 years. And I think that we can go to the next slide now. Suggestion as to the times that the gospel age has been punctuated by major events. Uh, that I think the first period, I would say, is from Christ's first advent to the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, A.D. 29 to 70. Then from 70 to 312 A.D., from the destruction of Jerusalem to relief under Constantine, and then 
from Constantine to Papal Rome as a civil power, from 313 to 538, and then the Papal dominance to the Reformation, 539 to 1517, and then the Reformation to the French Revolution when the Pope was exiled, 1517 to 1798, and then when Pope Pius the sixth died the next year, 1799 to 1873, and then Christ's return until the faithful church is complete, 1874, and I'll let somebody else be concerned of what, when that period will end. But I think we would call this the harvest. And I think we can go now to the um, next slide. Now, I will suggest that these major world events which we have seen, that's in the middle column, Long Depression, World War I, Great Depression, World War II, East versus West, and the pandemic and result, uh, probably resulting depression. That only leaves one more to go, and that's Armageddon. Now, if we compare this with the seven last plagues of the Exodus, we see the flies, the murrain that killed the cattle, the blains on man and beast, the hail, and fire that ran along upon the ground with thunder and lightning, it destroyed the first two crops of Egypt. Then came the locusts and they ate up the remaining two crops of Egypt when they had sprung up. And then a plague of darkness, is that due to the pandemic? Well, it's interesting that the plague of darkness lasted three days so that no man could move from his place for three days. What's happened to international travel now for two years so far? Now, we have one more plague to go, and I think that most of us would agree that the firstborn, death of the firstborn, would correspond to Armageddon. As we line up these uh, last seven plagues in the Exodus, four of them are definitely destructive, deadly. And they seem to line up without even pushing them around to World War I, World War II, the Cold War. And then, of course, I think we would agree the last one will be a devastating uh, plague of Armageddon. Now, it is of interest to us the effect these plague events or plagues are having on Babylon that it would appear the Lord is systematically destroying Babylon. With the first plague, the long depression, the call began to come out of Babylon, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. Our motivation should be that ye be not partakers of her sins. Now, there have been some morality problems uh, among various denominations that we've been hearing about, and we needn't think that becoming a Bible student makes one immune from that. But our motivation for coming out should be that we not be partakers of our sins, either of the kind that are moral sins, or of the kind that says... Uh, you must join us to be saved. No, we must join Christ to be saved and be faithful unto the end. Now, World War I destroyed the support of the monarchies for the various sectarian organizations because the monarchies were terminated in World War I. Those that remain are mostly in name only. The Great Depression, it was devastating to fundamentalism. As one writer in, um, back in the 1950s said that uh, the Great Depression routed fundamentalism. It was relegated only to the very fringes of Protestant thought that uh, 
the liberals had gained ascendancy in the major theological school, schools and cemeteries or seminaries. World War II, well, the idea of liberal Christianity was that ever since World War I, mankind was evolving into a great society or words similar to that. And that the Great Depression was only a little uh, twerk in the process of going to greater uh, Christianity and greater uh, civil government. But when World War II came, and it was just as bad as World War I had been, that devastated the liberal form of Christianity. Okay, they replaced it with something else that they called neo-orthodoxy, but it was nowhere near the uh, strength of the liberal Christianity during the Great Depression. So now the two major theologies of Protestantism have been dealt with. And then came the East versus West conflict. The locusts, you remember, were brought in by the East Wind in Egypt. And finally, they, after they had eaten up the crops of Egypt, the mighty West Wind came and drove them away again. During those decades, papacy claimed to be built equally on scripture and tradition. And while we know it's not built on scripture, we were watching the tradition being swept clean out from under uh, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy as well. And perhaps we can say uh, the Anglican tradition. Now what's happening at the present time? We seem to be having a pandemic, or some call it a panic-demic. And as a result of shutting down the borders and shutting down the societies, it's been a real hard thing for sectarian Christianity as well. Uh, in the state in which I live, they shut down the churches and the synagogues while they left the bars open. So really, once you've wiped out the fundamental basis for Protestant theology and the liberal basis for it and the tradition from Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, they had great wealth. But this pandemic is damaging sectarian Christianity and I think a bank a depression is bound to follow, that it will bankrupt sectarianism, so its great wealth is disappearing. I think our JW friends can understand that, and so can some of our other Protestant friends. The time comes, there's only one thing left, and that's the support of the people, and I think we can see that the support of the people will be lost in Armageddon. Now then, we are living in troubled times. Some of us today have lived through three of these plagues. I've lived uh, personally into at least parts of four of them. We are having our ups and downs as well as the world is. We must learn to adjust to these ups and downs. And one of the things we must learn is to be patient not simply with ourselves, but to be patient with others. We do want them to be patient with us, don't we? Now, if we understand where we are in the stream of time, in this period of major world events, seven plagues I will call them, we are told to get out of Babylon, that she be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. By virtue of coming out, we don't receive of Babylon's plagues. Now, how about our attitude towards those who are in sectarian Christianity? I think we realize that 
organizations or groups that say you must join us to be saved shall not be allowed to go into the kingdom. But how about the people? Yes, to varying degrees, they profess to be Christian, and varying degrees, they try to act Christian with Christian principles. I think we should regard that favorably. We may see sectarianism being washed away, but we should not be delighted that good Christian people are being hurt by it. After all, who are those who are washing denominationalism or sectarianism away? The atheists, especially the leftist atheists, the Muslims, are they more righteous than our sectarian friends? I think not. And that is the lesson of Habakkuk. Habakkuk asks the Lord, I know your people have sinned, but why do you allow the less righteous than they to administer the punishment? Well, briefly, the Lord responds, yes, I know, but wait till you see what happens to them. If we see the power of Christianity taken out of the world today, we should not view it as a total loss because there's a consolation prize. If Christianity is first wounded, then the world will not be able to blame Christianity, will not be able to blame Christ for Armageddon. And I think we should have the greater uh, sympathy or empathy for our Christian friends in the denominations. Now, what should we do in the circumstance where we're in with a pandemic, a depression following, I think, as I've said it before, there are two things that we should do. Get out of debt and stay out of debt. I think we can go now to the next chart. Now, the same seven plagues that have been detrimental to Babylon have been good for Israel, not necessarily good for the nations in which they are, but good for the nations to which they are destined. How about the Long Depression? Well, it brought about uh, that foreigners were allowed to buy land in Palestine. And the first foreign Jews to return to the land of Palestine with land that they owned, or that they bought and owned, was in 1878. And the first of five aliyahs began in 1880. World War I, it produced the Balfour Declaration. It made Israel as a homeland for the Jews. It was saying that uh, it should not impede the rights of Arabs and others who were already there. But Palestine was declared to be a homeland for the Jewish people. And of course, the second Aliyah, the third Aliyah brought us up to uh, World War I. And so that's followed by, by the Great Depression. Well, that bankrupted people worldwide. It also bankrupted the Jews. And those who were bankrupted, many of them were ready to go to Palestine because they had nothing left in, in the cities and countries where they had been. World War II drove the Jews from Central Europe. The East versus West struggle after World War II has been driving the Jews from Eastern Europe. In one year, 100,000 Jews went back to uh, 
Israel as a result. I think over a million Jews left what had been the Soviet Union. Today, 47% of world Jewry is already back in Israel. Now, the present pandemic that we have, does it suggest that the Jews will be driven from the West? What has been the attitude of so many in Western Europe? What is the terrible anti-spirit happening here in Canada and the States? It looks an awful lot like the situation in Germany 100 years ago. We will be watching it, but it is essential for us not to be a part of any part of the driving of the Jews from the West. Our sympathies, because the Lord is bringing them back, are with Israel. And if there is something that we can do to help the Jews from our areas of the world to go back to Israel, we should do so. And then after the Jews are pretty much fully regathered to Israel, that is when the Armageddon plague will come in. We can read about it in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. That is when the na nations from the north will invade, but God will miraculously rescue Israel. Now, I've told this before, but it certainly is applicable to what can happen when things look hopeless for Israel. Uh, back seven years ago, 2014, at the county fair, I asked one of the Jewish ladies uh, working next to us, uh, do you know about that missile was launched from Gaza, headed straight for the defense ministry in Tel Aviv? and they sent up an Iron Dome interceptor, and it missed. They almost never miss. They're 90 plus percent reliable, but it missed. They sent up a second one, and it missed, and a third one, and it missed. And when the situation looked hopeless, the wind suddenly blew it into the Mediterranean. And she looked at me and said, Yes, I know about that missile. My mother works in that defense ministry and she would have been killed. That took my breath away. A little later, I asked one of the others, do you have any feel for why that uh, missile, why all three of those interceptors missed? And she says, I think the Lord was telling us he's in charge. Now, there's more to the story, but we need to get on here. We want to have confidence in what the Lord is doing, not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in the Lord. Now, let's consider some of the things that we face, especially now in our time even more so than 100 years ago. So let's go to the next slide. There's a lot of hate. And where does hate come from, if not from the adversary himself? Jehovah God is bringing Israel back to the land that he promised. And it is to be from the river of Egypt under the great river, the river Euphrates, that's in Genesis chapter 15. So by that description, he's not talking about heaven or some exo-earth planet. It's talking about right here on the earth. And there's a response that Lucifer is giving to it. There is an anti-Israel response, especially among the atheists on the hard left and Christians on the hard right. The Christians allow them no inheritance in the land because the land is to be destroyed. The atheists allow them no inheritance in the land because they want to destroy all of Israel 
and the Islamicists. They're not only anti-Israel, but anti-all Jews. In fact, they want to kill all Jews and all Christians as well. Are there none that are pro-Israel? Yes, there are some, especially the Orthodox Jews, though in this country, they may only be about 15% of the total. Most of the others that are religious at all are either conservative or liberal, but also Bible-oriented Christians. And well, we have our differences and the understanding of how Christ died once for all, I think we can appreciate that there are some Christians who are in favor of the restoration of Israel and doing what they can to help the Jews go back to the land, especially from those countries where they are persecuted. Now we see that worldwide, the anti-Israel bandwagon is gaining more and more steam. And the lesson for us is we should absolutely stay off that bandwagon. We can go now to the next slide. What is this that's going on today in the spirit of atheism? It's relatively new. It was there in the French Revolution. That's a little over 200 years ago. It has only been ruling big nations in this world for about 104 years, starting with Russia. What would be attractive about atheism? Now, their idea is whatever you, uh, you want to do, you can do it because the end justifies the means, so they think. And if there is no God, then there's no right, there's no wrong. For whatever you do, you're guiltless. The more guilty a conscience you have, the more attractive that sounds. Nothing, uh, practically nothing in this world beats a clear conscience. If you have difficulty understanding someone who is guilt-ridden, maybe that's a good thing. We'll have the kingdom to get rid of that in them by changing them. Now, the lawyer will tell you, if you're guilty of something, you accuse your opponent before he accuses you. That puts him on the defensive. And uh, what's the consequences? Well, it's thieves who most accuse others of stealing. We see it as liars who most accuse others of lying. It is haters who most accuse others of hate speech. And you can go on and on. But the lesson for us is to have no part of that. Let our words be truthful and let us not deceive. If we are truth people, we should tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, why is it that uh, the atheist activists are so unhappy? Because they have no good cause. Everyone needs a cause, but there is no way to be happy if you don't have a good cause that you're supporting. Now, sometimes you are told that um, we do this, everybody has to do this because it has settled science. Uh, that's a misunderstanding of science. And uh, science at the time of um, Isaac Newton was you listen to the lecture for an hour, and if you went to the lab, you did an experiment is, uh, and compared that with what uh, Aristotle said would happen. And if your uh, experiment didn't come out the same, you had to look and see what you did in the experiment that was wrong. But Robert Boyle and the um, 
British Royal Academy of Science changed that, that you first postulate and then you experiment, you compare the experiment with the theory and you modify the theory as necessary. And that continues to be true today. So subtle science means really anti-science. Now let's consider ourselves too. We want to be a part of the bride for our Lord. Let's consider how do we treat our spouses? Because the way we treat our spouses today shows our Lord how we would treat him if we had the opportunity. Sometimes I don't like my answer. I'll also mention, um, I think it would be good to give a, an example or two. There was a good brother many, many years ago. He had trouble with his temper, but he really worked hard to try to control it. He told at one time that he and his wife had gone to a convention farther up the Pacific coast. And uh, when the convention was over, they were driving back towards Los Angeles. About an hour away from the convention, his wife said, we'll call him Tom. Uh, his wife said, Tom, Tom, we got to go back. Uh, I left my dress hanging in the, uh, uh, at the motel. Well, he knew they had to go back. And he was fuming every minute of the hour going back. They got to the motel, as he told the story, and he says, in the motel room, they found her dress hanging in the closet right next to his suit. Have we ever had experiences like that? We can go to the last slide now. on self-control. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, last verse of the chapter, RVIC has translated it as accurately, I think, as it can be done. I buffet my body and bring it into bondage. Yeah, we're having a fight with it. Lest by any means, after that I have preached to others, I myself should become disapproved or even more literally, I should become rejected as a misstruck coin. Now, a misstruck coin does not preserve an accurate image of the king or the emperor. Do we want to risk not preserving the image of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ? Now, of the 27 books of the New Testament, more than 20 warn us against fornication and other sexual sins. We must still watch ourselves, maybe even the more so, as the time goes along. Another thing, when I am insulted, do I condemn in return? What would Jesus do? Now, I should be, uh, try to make my body able to function the best that I am able. So when I'm offered junk food, do I consistently say, no, thank you? Did the Apostle James in Acts 15, 20? In the final analysis, the question is, will I display the image of my God and my King? Let's read again, 2 Peter in chapter 3, starting I think we'll start with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will have come as a thief, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat. Are we seeing this? 
and the earth and the works that are therein shall be exposed, is the early manuscript reading. Do we see things being exposed today? Seeing that these things are thus all to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and earnestly desiring the presence of the day of God, by reason of which the heaven being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Earlier, we've heard some tell about their experiences. But according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for these things, give diligence that ye may be found in peace, without spot, and blameless in his sight. Whether we are blameless in the sight of everybody in the world, we should be blameless in God's sight and Jesus' sight. So in conclusion, let's keep in mind, our life may be the only Bible that our neighbor ever reads. Let us live accordingly. Let us live our life so that even our enemies will, in Christ's kingdom, be relieved that we are the ones to help them. Let them not dread to hear that you or I, the ones who got back at them, are to rule with our Lord. But rather, let's live our lives so that even our enemies will be relieved that we, with Christ, are the ones who will help them. <laughs>